day. President Joe Biden of the United States and President Xi Jinping of China have had their much anticipated virtual summit meeting. Both sides have provided extensive readouts, or at least the Chinese have done. We'll come to the American readout in a moment. And it is possible to come to some preliminary views about where we are and what the state of US-China relations is. I would add that the United States has also provided off-the-record briefings by various of its officials, which you can find on the White House website. I'm not going to cover those because, in some respects, it is the readouts which I think are much more interesting, and those briefings don't really go beyond what appears in the readouts. Now, there was some uncertainty about what this summit meeting was all about. The United States has been agitating for a virtual summit meeting between the US and China and between the US and Chinese presidents ever since the new administration took office in January. And perhaps the greater mystery has not been why the United States wanted this virtual summit meeting. The president of the United States and his administration have a fairly open agenda of trying to shift US-China relations onto a kind of a la carte sort of system, whereby the United States cooperates and works with China on those issues which interest the United States, but China but uh, takes a confrontational approach to China on all other issues. And the virtual summit that the United States was agitating for did seem to be consistent with the US desire for that kind of agenda. The greater mystery, the real puzzle, is why the Chinese and Xi Jinping in particular, after a long period of several months when they seem to be extremely reticent about holding such a summit, ultimately agreed to do so. Now, I say that before I proceed further, I should say that if you go through the various readouts, it's quite clear that the United States made no progress in advancing its agenda with China, Xi Jinping took the predicted tough line on China's red lines. But since those red lines have been explained at length to the United States by other Chinese officials, it's not quite clear why Xi Jinping felt that he needed to do it also. Regardless, it's fair to say that if one is looking for an agreement, some kind of um, consensus, some kind of breakthrough points, in the summit, none was expected and none came. There was a mischievous article in the Financial Times, which is briefly headlined by the Financial Times, uh, and which was based on a, uh, in my opinion, misconstruction of some words of uh, the US National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan. Uh, there was an article, that article in the Financial Times, suggested that Xi Jinping had agreed to some sort of nuclear nuclear talks, talks about China's nuclear arsenal with the United States, something which, if it had been true, would indeed have been a very major departure from China's positions. But in fact, it's quite clear that no such agreement was reached and the, Uni uh, and the Financial Times was simply misunderstanding or perhaps misrepresenting the usual talks that take place between China and the United States, and which happen all the time, and which Jake Sullivan confirmed will continue, which look at strategic stability, in other words, which seek to maintain a stable relationship between the two sides and to keep lines of communication open. The Financial Times misconstrued those talks as talks about nuclear weapons, Undoubtedly, the topic of nuclear weapons will be discussed over the interchanges, the, inter the communications between China and the United States. But it's quite clear that the Chinese have refused uh, and are, have not agreed to enter into talks on 
uh, nuclear arms limitations with the United States, as the United States is very keen that they should do. Similarly, it's quite clear that there's been no major breakthrough or shift of position, certainly not from the Chinese side on the topic of Taiwan. The United States has slightly toned down some of its language with respect to Taiwan, or at least it did so over the course of the statements that have appeared in and around the summit meeting. I'm going to discuss that in a moment, but suffice to say that I don't think any weight should be placed on the brief and I suspect transitory moderation of US language on this issue. I suspect that the US understood that unless it damped down some of its language, there was a very risk, real risk that the summit would either break down or would fail to take place. And I think that before very long, we will see the United States reverting to its usual language on the Taiwan issue. And as for the Chinese, well, Xi Jinping, as we will see in a moment, did not moderate his language at all. Well, so no change on any of the substantive questions. But that doesn't mean that the summit in itself wasn't an interesting event. And now that I've read the various readouts, especially the Chinese readout, I think we can, we can see very clearly what the Chinese, or at least what Xi Jinping, was up to. Because what the summit meeting gave Xi Jinping an opportunity to do was to carry out a complete deconstruction and repudiation of the entire foreign policy philosophy of the United States. Now, he did so in his usual measured words and rather intellectual phrases. And as I will say shortly, I think most of what he said probably went completely over the heads of the American officials. But I think that Xi Jinping and his colleagues in the Standing Committee of the Politburo undoubtedly decided that this was something that they needed to do, and which they did um, over the course of this summit meeting, probably in order to convey their thinking to their own people, and in particular to the cadres of the Chinese Communist Party, who will no doubt be thoroughly briefed in various study sessions and such things about Xi Jinping's words, but also to broadcast to the world, to the international community, if you prefer, the Chinese riposte to the foreign policy philosophy of the United States and the way in which China is enunciating and setting out its own foreign policy philosophy, which is diametrically opposed to that of the United States. So this was an opportunity that the Chinese seem to have seized upon to use this virtual summit as that opportunity to showcase their entirely different thinking about foreign policy, inter international relations, democracy, as we'll come to shortly, globalization, and all those things. Anyway, Let's first go to the readouts and let's start with the American readout, which is always briefer and which, in contrast to the Chinese readout, as we shall see, is just a normal collection of the usual standard cliches. This is what the US readout, the White House readout says. President jo Joseph R. Biden Jr. met virtually on November 15th with President Xi Jinping of the People's Republic of China. The two leaders discussed the complex nature of relations between our two countries and the importance of managing competition responsibly. Note the word competition. As in previous discussions, the two leaders covered areas where our interests align and areas where our interests, values, and perspectives diverge. So, competition, the overall framework of 
the relationship between the United States and China is competition, confrontation if you prefer, but the United States is prepared to discuss and work with China on those issues where interests align, in other words, where the United States benefits from working with China, but will not work with China on those issues where US interests, what the US calls its values and its perspectives diverge. President Biden welcomed the opportunity to speak candidly and straightforwardly to President Xi about our intentions and priorities across a range of issues. So, US will continue its a la carte policy and it will continue to communicate to the Chinese not just this policy, but why the Chinese should comply with the United States on those issues which uh, the United States is concerned about, climate change, the pandemic, whatever, but that the United States continues to reserve the right to speak candidly and straightforwardly or rudely and bluntly, as some might, others, other people might say, about those other issues like the crisis, in, like the issues of Western China, Hong Kong, human rights and such. Anyway, carrying on, President Biden underscored that the United States will continue to stand for its interests and values at, and together with our allies and partners, ensure the rules of the road for the 21st century, advance an international system that is free, open and fair. So uh, the United States will stand up for its interests and values. In other words, it's not prepared to give up in any way its belief that it is an exceptional country and that it has its, uh, uh, in, in, that it is entitled to talk about what it calls its values, in other words, its human rights perspectives, and that it will do so together with its allies and partners, and that it will ensure the rules of the road for the 21st century advance an international system that is free, open and fair. In other words, it will continue to work to impose its conception of the rules-based international order, one where the rules are made by the United States and its friends and which are imposed on everyone else, including China. It's an interesting new expression, rules of the road, but there we go. And of course, free, open and fair. Well, we saw what that meant in that discussion that I did recently about the recent comments that Jake Sullivan meant it meant essentially a globalised international system in which the US elite is at the centre uh, and the elite of the other Western countries are at the centre and are able to form and control the international system and shape it according to their own interests. Anyway, that's what that language basically tells us. He emphasised the priority he places on reaching far-reaching investments at home, whilst we align with allies and partners abroad to take on the challenges of our time. In other words, the United States will continue to develop its own uh, uh, political and economic system in a way that will pre uh, and prepare the United States for conflict and uh, confrontation with and competition with China. That's what challenges of our times obviously means. Then we come to the values part of the reader. President Wright Biden raised concerns about the CRE's, PRC's practices in Western China and Hong Kong and Tibet, as well as human rights more broadly. He was clear about the need to protect American workers and industries from the PRC's unfair trade and economic practices. Note how the two, the human rights aspects, are conflated here with the commercial and business aspects. As I've said many times, the Chinese, who are deeply pragmatic people, I think would be prepared to work with the United States to come to some kind of mutual understanding on, of trade on commercial matters. 
But the problem is that the United States or the US government or the US political class talk about these business and trade issues, imparting to them a profoundly moralistic perspective and linking them with what they claim are China's human rights violations. The fact that the Chinese will not like that and that that makes trade negotiations, amongst, along with everything else, far more complicated than they might otherwise be, is not something which, it seems to me, the political class in the United States either understands or wants to understand. He also discussed the importance of the free and open Pacific and commu communicated the con continued determination of the United States to uphold our commitments in the region. Now, uh, importance of a free and open Indo-Pacific means that the United States is able to operate its ships, including its warships in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, and all those sort of places. And when he talks about... Um, the continued determination to uphold the, its commitments in the region, well, that is, of course, partly a reference to the US's existing alliances to countries like Australia, South Korea and Japan. But it is also, of course, a hint about continued US commitments to Taiwan. And in fact, Taiwan, as we see, comes up very shortly. President Biden reiterated the importance of freedom of navigation and safe overflight to the region's prosperity. Say freedom of navigation and safe overflight, as I said, means the United States sending its warships and patrolling them in places like the South China Sea, international waters, nobody disputes that, but close to China and very far from the United States. And the same applies to US overflights over the same areas. It might be a legal thing to do. It is still a provocative thing to do from a Chinese point of view. It is something which raises tensions in the area and the Chinese obviously don't like it. They don't say that it's illegal, but obviously if the United States persists in doing it, tension between China and the United States will continue and even grow and the Chinese uh, will take countermeasures. So that's perhaps something to uh, 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 bear in mind. But of course, the United States, as this readout shows, is not willing to make any concessions on this issue whatsoever. And now we come to Taiwan. On Taiwan, President Biden underscored that the United States remains committed to the One China policy guided by the Taiwan Relations Act, the three joint communiques and the six assurances, and that the United States strongly opposes unilateral efforts to change the status quo or undermine peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits. Now, that is an extremely interesting sentence because um, the Chinese and some commentators in the United States have recently taken to pointing out that whilst the United States now increasingly says that it does not support Taiwan's independence bid or independence drive, it doesn't oppose it either. Now, these words which we have just seen tiptoe ever so gently towards appearing to doing that because when it says that the United States strongly opposes unilateral efforts to change the status quo or undermine peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits and when that is said directly after the reiteration of the US commitment to the One China policy that could be taken as a statement that implies that the United States opposes Taiwan's independence drive. After all, a declaration of independence by Taiwan would be a unilateral effort to change the status quo 
or undermine peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits. So it is, if you like, a move, a small move, towards the Chinese position on Taiwan. However, I don't believe that the Chinese take that at all seriously. And the fact that the United States is engaging in this somewhat opaque language, talking about opposing unilateral efforts to change the status quo or undermine peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits, instead of simply and straightforwardly saying that it opposes Taiwan's drive to independence, the Chinese will say that the United States continues to provide itself regal room so that one day it can simply turn around and say that it does in fact support Taiwan's drive towards independence, and this does not contradict the US's previous policies or previous statements. So this is, if you like, a slight shift towards the Chinese position, but not a dramatic one, and not one which I think the Chinese, for their part, will place any reliance upon at all. I would add that the way in which this sentence has been written gives the impression of a warning to the Chinese. Because, of course, one could argue, and I think people in the United States will be encouraged to think that this sentence is a warning to China not to launch an invasion of Taiwan, because the United States strongly opposing unilateral efforts to change the status quo or undermine peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits is consistent with it is consistent with opposing a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. So given that this sentence appears to be, as I said, a gesture to the Chinese position, but is at the same time written in a way that appears to amount to warn China, the Chinese obviously will say to themselves, well, this isn't to be taken seriously or be relied upon in any way. The United States is sp speaking out of both sides of its mouth. It's telling us something that appears to be a gesture towards us, but at the same time, it's able to package the same sentence and form of words and tell the Taiwanese and the pro-Taiwan uh, um, commentators and people in Congress in the United States that it is warning, the, warning, us, warning us over Taiwan at the same time. So clearly this is not to be taken terribly seriously. And then we come to the last paragraph. President Biden also underscored the importance of managing strategic risks. He noted the need for common sense guardrails to ensure that competition does not veer into conflict and to keep lines of communication open. He raised specific trans transnational challenges where our interests intersect, such as health security. In particular, the two leaders discussed the existential nature of the climate crisis to the world and the important role that the United States and China can play. They also discussed the importance of taking measures to address global energy supplies, both issues that the United States is concerned about, by the way. Uh, global energy supplies do concern China, for example, but it is the Biden administration that is making the biggest running at the moment. And then the last section, the two leaders also exchanged views on key regional challenges, including DPRK, and that's North Korea, Afghanistan and Iran. Finally, they discussed ways for the two sides to continue discussions on a number of areas, with President Biden underscoring the importance of substantive and concrete conversations. Now, this is again very much a paragraph setting out the a la carte position that the United States is taking it in its relations with China, wants to take its, in its relations with China. It, it, it emphasizes again 
that there is conflict between the United States and China, competition, as Biden likes to call it. But he talks about maintaining lines of communication. He talks about creating guardrails. But he talks about cooperation on those issues that are of concern to the United States, the climate crisis, uh, the energy crisis, other such topics. But note that he does not recognise China's red lines. He talks about guardrails, but he doesn't talk about red lines. He doesn't in any place in this um, readout appear to concede that the Chinese have core interests and that the United States must respect them. So, in effect, this readout shows to us that the, Chi that the United States remains totally embedded within its underlying position. It sees China as a strategic competitor. It sees itself as in confrontation with China. It's not really prepared to shift on any of the major issues that are of concern to China, the South China Sea, the Taiwan, those sort of issues. But it still expects China's help on those issues like the climate crisis, global energy supplies, which are of concern to the United States. It's foreign policy a la carte. Now, let's turn to the much longer, far more interesting Chinese readout of the same call, which, let me stress, sets out in detail Xi Jinping's comments. And I'm going to read it in full, even though it's long, and I'm going to, again, undertake a certain amount of passing. On, morning, on the morning of 16th November, President Xi Jinping had a virtual meeting with Pres US President Joe Biden. The two sides had thorough and in-depth communication and exchanges on issues of strategic overall overarching and fundamental importance shaping the development of China-US relations and on important issues of mutual interest. S President Xi pointed out that both China and US are at critical stages of development and the global village of humanity faces multiple challenges. As the world's two largest economies and permanent members of the UN Security Council, China and the US need to increase communication and cooperation, each run their domestic affairs well and at the same time shoulder their international responsibilities and work together to advance the noble cause of world peace and development. This is the shared desire of the people of the two countries and around the world and joint mission of Chinese and American leaders. President Xi stressed that a sound and stable China-US relationship is required for advancing the two countries' respective development and for safeguarding a peaceful and stable international environment, including finding effective responses to global challenges such as climate change and the pandemic. Note again immediately the difference. The C says that a sound and stable China-US relationship is necessary for dealing with shared crises like climate change and the pandemic. In other words, it can't be done a la carte. You can't have competition and hostility on some issues and cooperation on others. You need a sound and stable relationship. In other words, you need to have mutual trust and mutual understanding and cooperation on all issues. So already there is a major difference. And then she continues, China and the US should respect each other, coexist in peace and pursue win-win cooperation. President Xi expressed his readiness to work with President Biden to build consensus and take action 
active steps to move China-US relations forward in a positive direction. Doing so will advance the interests of the two peoples and meet the expectations of the international community. So, whilst the United States talks about managing competition and seeks to pursue relations on a a la carte basis, with China cooperating with the US on issues that concern the United States, but the two powers competing about everything else. Xi Jinping talks about moving towards mutual respect, peaceful coexistence, and win-win cooperation. And he wants, in other words, a stable, trusting relationship between China and the US on all issues, not just some. And then we come to the next points. President Xi pointed out that the most important event in international relations over the past 50 years was the reopening and development of China-US relations, which has benefited the two countries and the whole world. The most important event in international relations in the coming 50 years will be for China and the US to find the right way to go get along. History is a fair judge. What a statesman a statesman does, be it right or wrong, be it an accomplishment or a failure, will all be recorded by history. It is hoped that President Biden will demonstrate political leadership and steer America's China policy back on the track of reason and pragmatism. In other words, the big breakthrough in international relations was the resumption of China-US relations in the 1970s. Since then, as a result of mistakes made by the United States in recent years, things have gone all right. But if the, the, the purpose now, the responsibility of the Chinese and US leaderships now is to put those relations back on track, put them back on the path of reason and pragmatism. The implication being that they are not on the path of reason and pragmatism at the moment. And it is on Biden's success or failure to do this that he will be judged by history. To continue, President C highlighted that a review of the experience and lessons learnt in growing China-US relations shows that for the two countries to get along in the new era three principles must be followed. First, mutual respect. The two countries need to respect each other's social systems and development paths, respect each other's core interests and major concerns, and respect each other's right to development. They need to treat each other as equals, keep differences under control, and seek common ground whilst reserving differences. So, mutual respect, acceptance of each other's social systems, equality, respect and recognition of each other's core interests. Diametrically opposite perspective to that of the United States. It rejects US exceptionalism. It says the way to deal with China, for the United States to work with China, is to show respect for China respect China's right to pursue its own course, respect each other's, China's core interests, and by definition, its red lines. Something that the United States shows no ability or willingness up to now to do. To continue. Second, peaceful coexistence. No conflict and no confrontation is a line that both sides must hold. The US has suggested coexistence between China and the US. One more word can be added to make it peaceful coexistence. Third, 
win-win cooperation with their interests deeply intertwined, China and the US stand to gain from cooperation and lose from confrontation. The world is big enough for the two countries to develop individually and collectively the right thing to do is to choose mutual f benefit over zero sum or the I win, you lose approach. In other words, what Xi, Xi Jinping is saying here is forget about this notion of managing competition. This isn't going to get us anywhere. You can't have competition in some areas and cooperation in others. What you must aim for is cooperation on all all areas and do so on the basis that, uh, that that is as much in your benefit to your benefit as it is in ours. That's win-win, that's a win-win approach. This whole notion of competition or ferocious competition or fierce competition or intense competition whatever it is that the United States now likes to call it, is a blind alley. To repeat again the words of the Chinese readout, no conflict and no confrontation is a line that both sides must hold. The opposite of this US idea of managing competition. And then we go to the next section. President Xi identified four priority areas where, the, where China and the US should focus their efforts on. First, shouldering responsibilities of major countries and leading global response to outstanding challenges. China-US cooperation may not solve all problems, but few problems can be solved without China-US cooperation. The global initiatives China has proposed are all open to the United States. That's a reference to the Belt and Road Initiative. We hope the reverse is also true. So what Xi Jinping is saying is let's not get ourselves into the blind alley of thinking that we're competing with each other for some kind of global hegemony. Let's, on the contrary, work together in our mutual interest and also in the greater interest of the entire world community, of all of humanity. There is no reason why the United States should see the Belt and Road Initiative as a threat. It's fully open to the United States to involve and participate in it. Why not therefore allow China to participate equally on an equal basis on whatever projects internationally the United States has. In reality, as Xi Jinping, of course, fully knows those international initiatives that the United States is coming up with are intended as counters to the Belt and Road Initiative, where Xi talks about international cooperation, the United States is locked into thinking about rivalry and international competition. And then he continues. Second, acting in the spirit of equality and mutual benefit to move forward exchanges at all levels and in all areas and generate more positive energy for China-US relations. President Xi expressed his readiness to stay in touch with President Biden through mutual means to set the direction and inject more momentum into bilateral relations. The two countries with broad common interests in a wide range of areas, including economy, energy, mill-to-mill, -mill, law enforcement, education, science, technology, cyber, environmental protection, and subnational interactions, should complement each other to make the cake bigger for China-US cooperation. The two sides should fully harness the dialogue channels and mechanisms between their diplomatic and security, economic and financial and climate change teams in an, in an effort 
to advance practical cooperation and resolve specific issues. So what, again, C is saying is let's communicate, let's work and talk to each other in a spirit of equality to see what it, to see how we can solve not just some issues that uh, are important to each of us but all of them economic energy military law enforcement education science technology cyber environment subnational interactions whatever we can discuss all of them our interests are mutual and our societies are complementary. There is no reason for all this talk of strategic competition. We are not out to achieve world domination, as so many people say. We are perfectly happy to work with the United States to find mutually, mutually successful uh, um, solutions to all problems if the United States is prepared to work with us. And then third, managing differences and sensitive issues in a constructive way to prevent China-US relations from getting derailed out of control. It is only natural for two countries to have differences. The key is to manage them constructively so they don't magnify or exacerbate. China will certainly defend its sovereignty, security and development interests. It is important that the US properly handle the relevant issues with prudence. In other words, recognize our red lines, accept that we have core interests. And if you do that, all that pro all those tensions that exist between us, between us can go away and we can cooperate successfully in the way that we've just said. So that, of course, is something the United States has shown no willingness to do, as I've discussed. But again, it's the deal that China is offering. And then to continue. Fourth, strengthening coordination and cooperation on major international and regional hotspot issues to provide more public goods to the world. The world is not tranquil. China and the US need to work together with the rest of the international community to defend world peace, promote global development and safeguard a fair and equitable international order. Now, that's a completely different thing from the rules-based international order that the United States talks about. It's a fair and equitable, equitable being equal international law order based on international law as we will see and of course Xi Jinping is again talking about the need here for China and the US to work together to sort out regional hotspots an example of course being Afghanistan stop seeing everything in a zero-sum way the United States loses in Afghanistan, China gains it in Afghanistan. It doesn't work like that. Our mutual interest is to achieve peace in all of these places so that the situation in the world can become diffused and the world, which is not tranquil, can become so. And then we have the usual picturesque Chinese metaphors that the Chinese seem to love. President Xi compared China and the US to two giant ships sailing in the ocean. It is important for the two sides to keep a steady hand on the tiller so that the two giant ships will break waves and forge ahead together without losing direction or speed, still less colliding with each other. Now that's a in my opinion, a most remarkable statement in my, some people might say that it's almost in its own way a, um, a hint that perhaps uh, President Biden himself doesn't have his hands on the tiller in quite the steady way that some might, be, uh, might, might feel is necessary or might require. Well, all, all up to now has been about China-US relations. It's about 
uh, how to manage the system, how to manage the international, the, the so-called relationship between the two. As we've seen, Xi Jinping has gone out of his way to say, let's put aside all these notions about competition between each other. We're not competing with each other. We have interests in common. We can be, if not friends, at least partners. But that is a partnership that is based on equal trust and equal respect. Now, he then goes to what I suspect is, in some ways, the most interesting part of the entire readout, because he now then just talks about China and about what China is up to. And this is, in some ways, the most interesting part of his readout, because he seems to be going out of his way to deny these claims about China being a country out to achieve world hegemony, out to achieve world domination. And he also attempts to correct certain misperceptions as he sees them about China's development path and about its political and social system. And this is what he said. President Xi explained China's development path and strategic intentions. The just concluded sixth plenary session of the 19th uh, Central uh, Communist Party Central Committee took stock of the major achievements and historical experience of the Chinese Communist Party in the past hundred years. Over the past century, the Communist Party of China has kept to its founding aspiration and mission of striving for the happiness of the Chinese people and rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. A lot has been accomplished in this direction, but that is far from enough. More needs to be done. President Xi said that when he took office, he said publicly that the Chinese people's aspiration for a better life is the goal to strive for. The Chinese people's aspiration for a better life is the biggest internal driver for China's development and an inevitable trend of history. Any attempt to stop this historical trend will be rejected by the Chinese people and will by no means succeed. President Xi stressed that as China's leader, serving the 1.4 billion Chinese people and working with them for a better life is a great challenge and a great responsibility. I shall put aside my own well-being and live up to people's expectations. So, the entire purpose of China's policies, of the policies of the Chinese government, which Xi Jinping leads, is to improve the life of China's people. That's their priority. That is their focus. They have no other. They're not on a quest for world domination or anything like that. If anyone, however, tries to stop China's economic development, it tries, if anyone tries to stand in the way of the improvement of the Chinese people's conditions of life, then by definition, they will have in the Chinese government an adversary. President Xi pointed out that the Chinese people have always loved and valued peace. Aggression or hegemony is not in the blood of the Chinese nation. Since the founding of the People's Republic, China has never started a single war or conflict and has never taken one inch of land from other countries. China has no intention to sell its own development path around the world. On the contrary, China encourages all countries to find development paths tailored to their respective national conditions. Now, I would say that some people would take issue with Xi Jinping's claim that China has never started a war. Vietnam, for example, might point to the 1979 border war between China and uh, Vietnam as a case when China did take the initiative in starting a conflict. But overall, Xi Jinping's point is that China is not Sikh, is not an aggressive country. It doesn't aspire to conquer anybody's territories. And in contrast to the Soviet Union, in the past, it has no belief 
or aspiration or desire to spread its political and social model to every part of the world. It recognises that every country has a right to find its own course. Anyway, to continue, President Xi stressed that opening up is a fundamental state policy and a hallmark of China. China will not change its determination to open up at a higher level. China will not change its determination to share development opportunities with the rest of the world. And China will not change its determination to make economic globalization more open, inclusive, balanced and beneficial to all. The new development paradigm that China is working to establish is aimed at expanding its domestic market, fostering both domestic and international circulations with greater scope and scale, and building a business environment that is more market-oriented, law-based, and up to international standards. All this will provide a bigger market and more opportunities to other countries. So, a completely different conception of globalization, not one dominated by the elite of one country, or indeed by any elite, rather one in which there is essentially free trade between countries, with China accepting that its previous economic model of acting as a factory and export machine is now in the past, and with China focused now on developing its own domestic market and of moving towards a new economic paradigm where it is focused on internal consumption rather than export. President Xi highlighted China's commitment to peace, development, equity, justice, democracy and freedom, which are common values of humanity. Drawing ideological lines or dividing the world into different camps or rival groups will only make the world suffer. The bitter lessons of the Cold War are still fresh in memory. We hope that the United States side can meet its word of not seeking a new Cold War with concrete actions. Now, he says an awful lot more about democracy in a moment. Some may be surprised to find Xi Jinping talking about democracy but in any event um, we will come that we will come to that shortly the key point about this paragraph is a rebuke to Biden's project of setting up this League of democracies to counter the so-called League of autocracies which is led by China now Xi Jinping says that's all nonsense. It's incredibly divisive. It's a reversion to Cold War style block thinking, and it should be completely and comprehensively put aside. And then C talks about Taiwan. And here I don't really need to pass it because he takes the usual Chinese line, um, which is a very hard line. President Xi stated China's principal position on the Taiwan question. He noted the new wave of tensions across the Taiwan Strait and ascribed the tensions to the repeated attempts by the Taiwan authorities to look for US support for their independence agenda, as well as the intention of some Americans to use Taiwan to contain China. Such moves are extremely dangerous, just like playing with fire. Whoever plays with fire will get burnt. The One China Principle and the Three China-US Joint Communiques are the political foundation of China-US relations. Previous US administrations have all made clear commitments on this question. The true status quo of the Taiwan question and what lies at the heart of the One China, of one China are as follows... There is but one China in the world, and Taiwan is part of China. And the government of the People's Republic of China is the sole legal government representing China. Achieving China's complete reunification is an aspiration shared by all sons and daughters of the Chinese nation. We have patience and we will strive for the prospect of peaceful reunification with utmost sincerity and efforts. That said, should the separatist forces 
four Taiwan independence provoke us, force our hands, or even cross the red line, we will be compelled to take resolute me measures. Resolute measures is, of course, a euphemism for military action. Note the particular words in this pa paragraph. The one China principle and the three chi uh, China-US joint communiques are the political foundation of China-US relations. What Xi Jinping is saying is, we don't have to be competitors, we can be partners. Maybe we can't be friends, but we can be partners, we can cooperate on everything. But if Taiwan secedes, we will take action. And if the United States backs Taiwan, then there's no question of strategic managing competition. There is no question of us being partners. At that point, we are adversaries, if not, e and perhaps even enemies. Anyway, Xi Jinping now discusses democracy. President Xi highlighted that civilizations are rich and diverse, and so is democracy. Democracy is not mass-produced with a uniform model or configuration for countries around the world. Whether a country is democratic or not should be left to its own people to decide. Dismissing forms of democracy that are different from one's own is in itself undemocratic. China is ready to have dialogues on human rights on the basis of mutual respect, but we oppose using human rights to meddle in other countries' internal affairs. Now, this comes down to the weaponization of human rights, which is what has been happening, and the way in which the United States has now attempted to use human rights law in order to, in effect, negate all other forms of international law so as to give itself the right to interfere in the internal affairs of all countries. This is what the rules-based international order is all about. And Xi Jinping says, you do not have any ownership over human rights. You do not have any ownership over the concept of democracy either. It is not for you to come along and say that international, uh, that human rights and democracy, the fact that you so you believe that you possess these things, that that gives you a right to meddle and interfere and involve yourself in the affairs of all countries and to disregard international law in doing so. It's an important point. It's one that's been made before, both by the Chinese and the Russians, and Xi Jinping has set it out in this paragraph. President Xi pointed out that China and the US need to uphold the international system with the UN at its core, the international order underpinned by international law, and the basic norms governing U international relations based on the purposes and principles of the United Nations Charter. Multilateral, multilateralism without China-US cooperation is incomplete. So, no rules-based international order, international relations, including relations between China and the US, should be based instead on international law, the foundation of which is the United Nations system, in which the United States and China are equal members, each having identical rights as set out in the UN Charter. I did, some months ago, a programme contrasting the difference between international law and the rules-based international order, and I explained how the Chinese and the Russians stand for international law, even as the United States increasingly talks about the rules-based international order. And here we see, once again, the contrast that the Chinese are making between the two. And then we come to the specific points here, which are, are, are we now move away from the more philosophical issues. And at this point, I'm going to be I'm going to be a little 
briefer because here these are less com controversial issues. On trade ties, President Xi described China-US economic and trade relations as mutually beneficial in nature. Business is business. Economic and trade issues between two countries should not be politicised. The two countries need to make the cake bigger for cooperation. China takes seriously the wishes of US business community to travel to China more easily and has agreed to upgrade fast-track arrangements, which will further enhance economic and trade exchanges between China and the US and boost the recovery of the two economies. The US should stop abusing or overstretching the concept of national security to suppress Chinese businesses. That's a clear reference to the Huawei uh, affair. It is imperative for China and the US to maintain communication on macroeconomic policies, support world economic recovery, and guard against economic and financial risks. The US should be mindful of the spillover effect of its domestic macro policies and adopt responsible macroeconomic policies. That is a direct hint that it is the United States, through its uh, uh, um, reckless money printing and deficit uh, policies, budget deficit policies, that is ultimately responsible for worldwide inflation. And inflation, which, by the way, is affecting China also. On energy security, President Xi noted the need for China and the US to call on the international community to jointly protect global energy security, strengthen cooperation on natural gas, the new energy, and work with other countries to keep global industrial and supply chains safe and stable. Well, not much to say about that, except that it's interesting that natural gas seems to have been the main point of discussion. Then, on climate change, President Xi recalled China-US cooperation that helped bring about the Paris Agreement. He pointed out that as both countries are transitioning to green and low-carbon economy, climate change can well become a new highlight co for cooperation. And then there is much discussion about this, but then he does make the point that China is still a developing country and the issue of unbalanced and inadequate development still stands out. All countries need to uphold the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and strike a balance between addressing climate change and protective li protecting livelihoods. What the world needs is less finger pointing or blame games, more solidarity and cooperation. But words matter but actions matter even more, and developed countries need to earnestly fulfil their historic responsibilities and due obligations and maintain policy consistency. So what he's basically saying there is, yes, we take our responsibilities over global climate change seriously, but don't expect us simply to close down our entire coal-generating industry that is impractical. You are asking for the impossible. We are still a developing country. We will do it incrementally at our own pace. But our objective of going carbon neutral is ultimately the same as yours, except, of course, that we mean it and we're not entirely sure that we don't. The next section is about the pandemic. Then there are references to what President Biden had to say. And the Chinese readout is quite interesting on this. It says the following. President Biden said that the US-China relationship is the most important bilateral relationship in the world. As two major countries, the US and China, have a responsibility to the world as well as to our people. The two sides need to have open and candid dialogues to enhance understanding of each other's intentions and make sure that competition between the two countries is fair and healthy and does not veer into conflict. President Biden echoed President Xi's comment that history is a fair judge and that they should make the relationship work and not mess it up. Or very, China has been a major power since 5,000 years ago, 
Biden reiterated that the United States does not seek to change China's system, the revitalization of its alliances is not anti-China, and the US has no intention to have a conflict with China. Well, I'm sure Xi Jinping heard all that with great attention. <laughs> then we will go on to come to the issue of Taiwan. Biden reaffirmed the US government's long-standing one China policy, stated that the US does not support Taiwan independence and expressed the hope for peace and stability to be maintained in the Taiwan Straits. So they don't support Taiwan independence, but they don't oppose it either. And that's the point that I made when I discussed the uh, previous, the American readout. So you see that the Chinese here are perhaps being rather more honest about what the Americans are saying than what the Americans themselves are saying. And then we continue. The US is willing to work with China on the basis of mutual respect and peaceful coexistence, increase communication, reduce misperception and handle differences constructively. Biden emphasised the need for US and China to work more closely in areas where interests align, respond to global challenges such as the pandemic, and climate change and deliver better lives to the two people, to the two peoples. The point about interests align suggests that he insists on competition on other issues and that's of course what the American readout says. We should encourage the younger generation to interact more and be more exposed to each other's cultures which make the world a better place. And then we learn that the two sides exchange views on Afghanistan, the Iranian issue, the situation of the Korean Peninsula, other international and regional issues of mutual interest. The two presidents agree that their meeting is candid, constructive, substantive and productive. Note that there's no word here about warmth or friendship, but perhaps that's too much to expect. It helps increase mutual understanding and to the positive expectation of the international community for this relationship and sends a powerful message to the two countries and the world. The two sides agree to maintain close communication in different forms and steer China-US relations back on the track of sound and steady development for the good of people in both countries and around the world. So there it is, a profound difference in foreign policy philosophies. United States, still convinced of its own exceptionalism, convinced that China is its strategic rival, seeking to uh, negotiate or work with China on issues that are important to itself, but determined to contain and box in China on all other issues, even as it continues to pursue its goal of establishing a rules-based international order, one with the United States at its core and one serving the interests of the US, of US elites and one in which the United States and those elites in effect set the rules. Uh, one also in which the United States refuses to oppose the Taiwanese drive towards independence, but says to China that it doesn't support Taiwan's independence. And contrast that with the Chinese approach, saying, why be rivals? Why be enemies? Why not instead be partners? The fact that our economy and our society are developing at a rapid pace is a good thing. We have no interest in imposing ourselves on the world. We've never started wars and have no intention of doing so. We have no desire to displace you as uh, a major country in the international system. But we do expect that our core interests will be respected, that our red lines will be respected. And in return, we are willing to work with you on all issues not just those issues which you say are of interest only to you. 
But the basis for that is mutual respect, mutual acknowledgement that each country has the right to develop in its own way and a system based on international law which recognises our equality with you and indeed the equality of all countries with each other and which does not seek to use human rights and concepts like democracy to entitle one side, in this case the United States, to interfere in the affairs of all other countries. A profound difference of philosophies. I would say an irreconcilable interest, a difference of philosophies. And on the specific issue of Taiwan, a exceptionally tough restatement of China's position. Taiwan is part of China. The only legitimate government of China is the one in Beijing. If the United States acts in order to obstruct the reunification of China, which may be peaceful or may not be peaceful, depending on what the authorities in Taiwan do, if the United States acts to interfere with the drive for China's reunification, then China ceases to be a partner, it ceases even to be a strategic competitor, it becomes an enemy. So, given this enormous, irreconcilable difference in philosophies, what has in fact been achieved by this summit in practical terms. Well, all that has been achieved, to my mind, is to expose this profound philosophical difference, to set the terms for the future global rivalry that will now take place between these two major powers and their respective camps, and to set out what that rivalry will be about. It will not be democracies versus autocracies, the absurd nonsense that the Biden administration is peddling. It will be, as the Chinese want to say, a world in which we see an exception, a restless, exceptionalist power, the United States, nervously seeking to pre pre preserve its preeminence in the international system against the China and the Nations aligned and allied with it would seek instead a new international system based on equality, international law, mutual respect and respect for each other's, each country's development paths. That is the true division, or so the Chinese are saying, that is taking place in the world and on the eve of Biden's summit for democracies, they've used this summit to highlight that fact and make it clear both to their own people and to the world in general. Well, that's it. That's the end of this long programme. I hope you've learned something from it. I'm going to briefly say that if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to uh, check your subscription to this channel. All sorts of strange things are happening to my subscriber rate at the moment, which no doubt YouTube has the explanation for, but please do check your subscription and subscribe to this channel. And also remember to check us out on Locals. Thank you for joining me again today. I look forward to you again joining me again soon and have a wonderful day until then.